books. It's a lot of information in those libraries. Howdy, everybody. Thanks for stopping in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology.com. I am Mr. Ulrich. In this video, we're going to be talking about organization. And not really organization in libraries and schools, perhaps, but organization in libraries in eukaryotic cells. And we're talking about genetic material inside of that nucleus. So it's a lot of material that we have to keep organized. In a human cell, we're talking about about 3 billion base pairs, which works out to be about 3 meters long inside of each cell. That's an awful lot of material that we have to cram into each one of those 10 trillion cells. Not only that, we have to keep it organized so that we can, when we go through the cell division, each one of those cells will get a complete set of all of that information. That's a lot of information. So let's look over how, how this stuff is crammed into uh, each each cell. Uh, first off, we got the, the DNA, which is uh, twisted into this double helix pattern. That twisted ladder, the double helix, is wrapped around special proteins in the nucleus called histones. Uh, act like little spools. And that uh, string of pearls is coiled again into kind of like a phone cord, which is wrapped up back and forth and kind of smooshed together into the individual chromatids of a chromosome and uh, that all packs into in human cells anyway human autosomic cells um, we're talking about 46 individual chromosomes packets of information it's a lot of stuff in diploid organisms that are sexually reproducing like us humans all of the material, all of the genetic materials uh, of those chromosomes are arranged in pairs, what we call homologous chromosomes. They're called homologous. Homo means same. Uh, logos, for our purposes, we can think of it as writing stuff down, like captain's log. Uh, so same written. Uh, that means that the material, the genes that are on the homologous chromosomes code for the same traits on either chromosome. So, for example, in this diagram, the colored bands on either one of those homologous chromosomes indicates a, the allele for uh, flower color. Uh, we can talk about the region, we refer to that, that, that as the locus. Uh, so that a, a gene at that particular locus uh, would be the allele that influences flower color. So uh, homologous chromosomes have uh, the same traits encoded on them, though they may have different alleles. In human cells, we have about 33,000 genes. Uh, those genes are packaged into 23 pairs of those homologous chromosomes. Now, Gregor Mendel's law of segregation states that uh, alleles, individual alleles, uh, are the things that are going to segregate during gamete formation. Now, we know a little bit more about the molecular biology of gamete formation, so we know that it's not actually the alleles that are going to do this. Um, that during gamete formation, it's actually the homologous chromosomes that segregate, and they bring with them the packages of alleles. So this directly flies in the face of the law of independent assortment, where those alleles would segregate independently of one another. We know that that's actually not the case. That will be the case with alleles that are on separate chromosomes, Chromosomes, which is what Mendel saw, but in the case of, of uh, genes that are on the same chromosome, where they say they're linked, they tend to be inherited together like red hair and freckles. Uh, that's the classic example. If you get the gene for red hair, uh, since it is on the same chromosome as the gene for freckles is located, uh, you're going to inherit that as well. Of course, to just add more complexity to the whole situation. Um, it does turn out that we can actually switch alleles or switch genes um, on the same chromosome. Uh, during meiosis when tetrads form, I hope you remember this from reproduction and development, um, sections of uh, homologous chromosomes can switch position and so it'll kind of just kind of shuffle those uh, alleles up even more, uh, adds even more genetic diversity to sexual reproduction. Researchers and oftentimes uh, diagnosticians uh, are going to want to take a look at chromosomes. 
uh, both to learn from them and in the case of babies make sure that uh, there aren't any chromosomal abnormalities and if there are uh, parents can prepare for those abnormalities uh, so what we're going to need to do is we're going to need some cells uh, now babies are sloughing off skin cells just like you and I are sloughing off skin cells so the amniotic fluid surrounding them uh, is loaded with cells uh, what we do is go in with a needle um, and withdraw a little bit of amniotic fluid of course we're doing this with, this with an ultrasound going at the same time so we know right where the needle is and where the baby is uh, so we take a little bit of that amniotic fluid out and look for some cells that are in the process of dividing take a picture of them um, and uh, actually cut out the individual uh, the pictures there of the individual chromosomes and arrange them by size and shape and banding pattern and use special dyes to give them a characteristic banding pattern to find the homologous pairs of chromosomes and this determines what we call the karyotype uh, what type of chromosomes are going to be present in the, um, in the nucleus of that organism Parents can often find out the gender of their unborn baby through an ultrasound. Uh, sometimes they still get a little surprised, <laughs> as the sometimes we can mistake some parts for other parts when they're still in development. Um, certainly a more invasive way would be through the karyotype. Um, but when we start looking at the chromosomes themselves, um, the first 22 homologous pairs of chromosomes are referred to as the body chromosomes or autosomes and uh, the last two are referred to as the sex chromosomes and these are the ones that are going to determine gender for humans if you have two large chromosomes uh, you are XX the large chromosome is the X chromosome and you are a girl if you have one large chromosome and one little tiny bitty chromosome um, the little ones the Y chromosome so if you're XY you're a male that would make this individual a wait for it boy We just discussed previously um, how Mendel wasn't quite right with the law of independent assortment. We know now that it's not individual alleles that are doing the segregating. Instead, it's whole chromosomes. It's the homologous pairs of chromosomes that are actually going to segregate each one going into the uh, respective gametes that are formed. So when we're doing a Punnett square, uh, we can think of a Punnett square as not just alleles that are segregating, but whole chromosomes that are segregating. And we can do the same thing, draw a Punnett square for those sex chromosomes. Uh, be as simple as putting in the X or the Y for the male. That means uh, the male will either make sperm that contain the X chromosome or the Y chromosome. Um, and females will have either uh, gametes, eggs with X chromosomes or X chromosomes. Not so exciting. And then we just do the old plug and chug. And sure enough, when we do the math, it's about half and half male female and that's about the gender skew uh, in global populations so what this means is that chromosomes don't actually come in pairs all the time those X and Y chromosomes actually have different traits coded on them they code for different proteins so in dudes sex chromosomes aren't actually homologous so, alleles. If they're on the same chromosome, they tend to be inherited together. We call this gene linkage. Uh, now, when they're all the way on that last set of chromosomes, on the, set, on the sex chromosomes, the X or the Y chromosomes, since they are inherited along with gender, we call those sex-linked traits. So as far as the Y chromosome goes, Having it is what gives you male traits. Uh, the weird thing is, is that there isn't a whole lot of genetic information on this tiny little Y chromosome. Of course, will girls show wilding traits? No, of course not. Girls can't show wilding traits because they don't have Y chromosomes. It's the guys who have the Y chromosomes. So any trait that's encoded on the Y chromosome, girls aren't going to have. The classic example is called pineal hair. Uh, your pinea are the uh, outer part of your ears. So when you've seen, usually old guys, um, they're the ones who might have this hair, tufts of hair growing out of the pinea of their ears. 
Uh, that's a Y-link trait. Where the Y chromosome is a tiny little thing, the X chromosome is a substantial chromosome. Um, traits that are on this chromosome are referred to as X-link traits. Um, boys and girls both have them, but uh, because boys have one where the girls have two, the pattern of inheritance is, um, well, not uh, gender equal. So who would show recessive X-link traits more often? You might think that since girls have two chromosomes, you'd be tempted to say that uh, they would be more likely, but actually it's the other way around. Because girls have two chances to have a dominant allele, uh, they stand a much better chance of not showing recessive traits than boys do. Let's look at how X-link traits work out in Punnett squares. Um, a classic example is color blindness. It is due to the lack of a uh, gene, functioning gene, that codes for a functioning protein. So uh, therefore, color blindness is recessive. The way we write it down is we're going to write a big old X to show that it's X-linked, and then put in the superscript uh, to represent the allele. Uh, that'd be the dominant here, be the recessive. So when we look at this in a, an actual Punnett square problem, let's say we got a dad who's got normal vision and a mom who's got normal vision too, but she happens to be a carrier. When we work this out in a Punnett square, we'll do it the same way that we do Punnett squares for sex determination. Uh, we'll segregate the whole uh, sex chromosomes. And when we work out the Punnett square, you can see that half of the boys, there's a 50% chance that the boys will be uh, colorblind. Uh, there's a 50% chance that the girls will be carriers, but there's a 0% chance that they're going to be colorblind. So this means that when it comes to X-link traits, um, girls can be heterozygous. That means they can be carriers. Guys, because we only have one chromosome, we just can't, we don't have a chance to be heterozygous carriers. We either have it or we don't. This also means that dads only pass their X-link traits onto their daughters. They don't pass them onto their sons. They pass Y chromosomes onto their sons. Well, we'll stop there. Uh, once again, want to thank you for tuning in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology uh, You can always send me feedback uh, to my email address, which is kulrich at newpults.k12.ny.us. Uh, and of course, you can always find supporting information, um, uh, PowerPoints, and handouts, and review material, and all kinds of other good nonsense on Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you in class.